You've heard the expression, where there's a will, there's a way. Have you organized your affairs to prevent confusion and family disputes when you're gone? Today on Family Matters, estate planning. Ask any lawyer to describe their most bitter, high-conflict case, and chances are you'll hear about family members in a vicious dispute over a deceased relative's estate. Sometimes all the money is depleted by endless litigation between rivaling factions of the deceased family, including spouses, ex-spouses, and children from different relationships. Today, we're talking about a subject that everyone needs to know about, estate planning. Our first guest is lawyer Lisa Eames. Lisa, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Let me ask you the most basic question. Why does everyone need to have a will? Well, a will is a document that a person can use as a tool to voice what their wishes are after they pass away. It's really your last opportunity to do so. so the will, what the will will do is it will allow you to indicate who you'd like to um, essentially administer your estate and where you want your property to go. As well, if you have minor children, the will is the tool you use to appoint a guardian for those children. Although in some jurisdiction, I guess the court wouldn't be bound by that and the court could appoint somebody else and give them custody. That's correct. I mean, the court is always, I think, going to be guided by what's in the best interest of the children. So if what you include in your will is contrary to that, then absolutely. But most of the time, it's really about your property, your money, who gets what. Exactly. And I guess uh, it's very important, as you pointed out, that you get to select who is going to administer that estate, who's responsible for carrying out your wishes? Exactly. Is that a fair way to put it? I think that's a, a very fair way to put it. And the way to get a will is to have a lawyer draft a will for you, correct? That's correct. So what about all these internet will kits that you see online? Uh, some bookstores sell fill-in-the-blank wills. Yeah. Are they a good idea? Well, as a lawyer, I mean, it, it, I don't want it to come across as self-serving to say they're a bad idea, but in my view they are a bad idea because what what they don't do is they don't provide for the intricacies of will making and um, they don't they're not specifically tailored to the particular jurisdiction that you're living in so there's just like a one-size-fits-all are they yeah. good enough if you just have a bank account you're mm -hmm. living in a rented apartment you don't have much mm -hmm. in the way of assets well, I, th I mean, I think it really depends on your circumstances. I mean, if you have if you have children, for instance, who are minor, who would be minor beneficiaries under your will, then you're going to need to create a testamentary trust for those children, and, and because they won't be able to take your assets immediately upon your passing if they're minors. So, uh, in in the grand scheme of things, I think it's essential that you have legal advice so that you can determine what your obligations are as well as um, what your options are for disposing of your assets. What's the average cost do you, uh, do you figure for uh, a will? What, what would a lawyer charge? Well in the jurisdiction where I work, I mean what we do is for spouses who have essentially mirror image wills, uh, we will, uh, the cost is I would say between five hundred and one thousand dollars for that service. Uh, for an individual will it's less than that, probably two fifty to five hundred, so it's very reasonable. I think a lot of people don't realize though that a will doesn't last necessarily forever, that there's some life events that can occur that will make it necessary to have a new one. Mm -hmm. For example, getting married. Absolutely. If you get married in certain jurisdictions, that marriage will revoke your will, so the will will no longer be effective in, in the manner in which you intended it. What about if you separate? Well, if you separate, separation generally won't invalidate a will. However, if you, if you divorce, 
the, any gifts in, in many jurisdictions, um, what, what will happen is uh, any gifts or any appointments you made to a spouse following the divorce, those, those gifts will be revoked and the, the spouse will be treated to have essentially predeceased the person who made the will. So it's very important yeah. if you're getting married or you're separating or getting divorced, you should really pull that will out, go back to the lawyer and mm -hmm. find out uh, if you need to write a new one or change mm -hmm. what you've got. Absolutely. I mean, anytime I'm advising clients in a family law scenario, that's part of the package of advice that I'm providing. I, I, I'm glad you, you, you said that because I think a lot of people mm -hmm. forget that. I know wills yeah. are very rarely mentioned in family court mm -hmm. where I work. What about if you don't have a will? What happens mm -hmm. to your property? Well, your pro if you don't have a will, uh, your property will generally be disposed of in accordance with a formula set out in a piece of legislation in whichever jurisdiction that you live. So the government essentially will determine how your assets are divided. So there's this uh, piece of legislation in every jurisdiction that says, and is it fair mm -hmm. to say that most of the time the money would go to your next of kin? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think oftentimes if there's just a spouse involved in, there are no children, say there's just a spouse, then your assets would all go to that spouse. Right. And then if there are children involved as well, then there'll be a, se a separate formula that will determine how the assets are then um, divested. So if you don't want that, yeah. you would have to have a will. And what mm -hmm. about who gets to administer your estate if you don't have a will? Well, that, I mean, you raise a good point because if you have a will, you have an executor who's automatically appointed to administer your estate. If you don't have that, a family member or close friend has to come forward and ask the court for essentially to be appointed as the administrator of your estate, which it can be difficult because it's more timely, frankly, from the date of the, the death of the individual until an administrator can be appointed. So there's a period of time when your estate's really not being properly administered. As well, there can be contentious issues. I mean, in, in your That's will. That's right. Yeah. We, we, uh, there may be numerous family members Absolutely. that would like to have that role of being the administrator. That's right. And then uh, I guess you have to go to court and ask a judge to decide who's most qualified. Exactly. And that would cost money. That would. And if you are the executor or the administrator of an estate, can you also be a beneficiary and, and collect from the, uh, from the estate? Absolutely. So you're not you're not precluded. You're not, absolutely. And in most cases, spouses will uh, will be administ pardon me, executors and also um, beneficiaries. beneficiaries. So it's not uncommon, absolutely. Well, I think you've given us a very good start to this very interesting topic. When we come back, we're going to hear about financial planning for your estate from an investment advisor. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion of estate planning. I'm pleased to welcome our next guest who is an investment advisor and his name is Jim Doyle. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Tell me, I think uh, it's important to point out that although we're talking about wills, which take over when a person dies, it's very important to also have a living will, isn't it? Huge, absolutely huge. And those are normally called powers of attorney. The enduring power of attorney, which survives mental incapacity or infirmity, is so important when you have a mortgage or you want to make sure you get to choose who manages your money. And that really is important if you become incapacitated, if you, you're in a coma or you become mentally incompetent. And uh, most people need two. You need one for your body to take care of your health care needs and one for your property, correct? Absolutely. I think the term we use is a representation agreement. It's different in every jurisdiction, but the idea is this should really be done at the same time as a will, shouldn't it? Absolutely. So what are some of the big mistakes that people make when they plan their estate? One is that they don't talk to their family members in terms of what they want, why they want, and what their choices are going to be. Maybe it's difficult to talk about what's going to happen when you're gone, or maybe they want, they, they, they want to remain private. Lots of families have a great deal of difficulty talking to their siblings, talking to their other family members about money. It's one of the high conflict issues that a lot of families would like to stay away from. So why is that a mistake? 
Why it's a mistake is because the legacy of, of a family building wealth over a period of time can be passed on to children with very unintended consequences. What a sad legacy. Why, what would be the unintended consequences? An example might be conflict between siblings, particularly if there's a family business or a substantial asset that maybe one person doesn't want and doesn't have the financial resources to buy out the other person. So is it important to sit down as a family and say, look, this is what I want done with my property when I'm gone? I believe it's absolutely imperative. And why can't they find out when the will is read after the person's deceased? Because it's very difficult to make changes before circumstances are known what they are. Would it be possible then, let's say that uh, the scenario you raised was that the person has left a family business to somebody who doesn't want it. Can't the family fix that after the person's gone? Unfortunately, it's very difficult to engage in that sort of activity and it's very expensive. Why? Let's assume that you're being asked to be the co-owner of a business and you don't want to take on that role. You simply want the money out for the value of the business. Can the business afford to pay you out and still continue to exist? So one big mistake is people don't talk openly with their loved ones about what they want done with their property when they're gone. Any other mistakes that people make in the way they organize their finances? We had a family come to us a ways back, a very, very significant piece of property that were willed to a number of children. Mm -hmm. The value of the property was such that none of the children had the capacity to buy out one child who wanted out. Thus, the remaining children are going to all be forced to sell. So the, the one person can actually force the other siblings to sell the property if they can't come up with the money to buy them out. That's correct. You know, you would think that people who have that kind of property would be in tune with what their children want or don't want. So it sounds to me like it's not just the deceased person that needs to do some talking before they die, but it seems to me that the, the, your children have to have a talk with their parents about what they want and what they don't want when their parents pass away. That is a beautiful subject. I wish a lot more parents would engage in that. But it's uncomfortable because, you know, it, 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 you may sound greedy. Imagine going to your parents saying, you know, I wish you a long life, but uh, please don't forget me when you're thinking about that diamond ring. Well, you're right. It, it is very, very tender and it's very difficult for a lot of people to go to their professional advisors, whether it's a lawyer or an accountant or an investment advisor, and say, can you help me facilitate this conversation? Do you think it's important when a person is planning their estate to come and see an investment advisor uh, before they go to the lawyer to have a, a will drafted? I believe it's absolutely imperative. What about, I'll ask you another sensitive uh, question then, what if you don't really trust anybody in your family to be your executor and you worry that there might be jealousies if you pick one over the other and if you pick them jointly to be your executors, maybe they won't get along and they won't be able to make decisions. Can you go to a professional financial institution and have them administer your estate for you? I'd say that's great advice, particularly when the situations can be complex or you know for certainty that there's going to be a level of conflict involved in that situation. So what would it cost then to have a financial manager professionally manage your estate? Many of the financial institutions are legislated as to the maximum they can potentially charge, up to 5% of the value of the assets under uh, administration. Per year? Per year. 5% well, of the estate me, per a, year. A one-time fee of up to 5% per year and a 0.4 annual administration fee thereafter. 0.4 of a percent after that. And some estates can go on for years, can't they? And there can be multiple additional services that you might want them to take on and potentially be paying for. Do a lot of people do this? I don't see it very often because a lot of people believe that a simple executor is a simple job and I have to suggest it's a very thankless job. Is it possible if you become the executor of someone's estate and don't really know how to do it and don't want to do it, maybe you're too busy, uh, can you then delegate the job to a financial manager? You can work in, in a co-advisor relationship with many of the financial institutions and many of them are very happy to help you take that task on. Well, I think that you've given us a lot of solutions for people who may not have thought of the issues that can arise. I thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure. When we come back after the break, we will be talking with lawyer Rick Bikram in Chambers. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Family Matters and our discussion of wills and estates. We are now in chambers with lawyer Rick Bikram, and you are a lawyer that specializes in wills and estates. Correct. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to ask you about the special challenges that people face if they've come out of a relationship, they have children, they've got an ex-partner, they're in a new relationship, they may have children from that relationship, their new partner may have children from their re former relationship. Are there special challenges for you as a lawyer in drafting wills for people in those situations? Absolutely, and it's terrifying that scenario that you just presented to me. If a client like that comes into my office, the first thing that I want to see is what happened in the past. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. It's very important. So you want to see their separation agreements, their court orders? Absolutely. Why? And it's because in order for somebody to give away what they've accumulated in their life, they have to know what they're giving away. And if there's pre-existing agreements in place such that would create a creditor, for instance, there's spousal support obligations in place, uh, that will be important for the executor of the will uh, to execute on. So it's very important that a person who comes to see you who has already had a relationship and they have a contract or a court order, they need to bring that to you so that you know if there's an obligation they've already got, they may have tied up that property already? Absolutely, because property division, for instance, let's take that as an example, that could have already been dealt with before the new relationship. Absolutely. So that's one important point that we want people to know. Now, I also want to ask you about family members trying to overturn a will after a person has died. I understand that you work in that field quite a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of situations cause this kind of conflict after a person has died? Well, as you know, Your Honor, we're an aging society. We're growing older. And what I'm starting to see a lot of that's coming across my desk is the scenario where we have a very elderly person, say somewhere between the 80s and 90s, and they're being taken advantage of. And who, who could possibly take advantage? Well, caregivers. Caregivers come in, take care. And, and, and nowadays, you can download a will online. Right. Or you could go to the local uh, stationery store and buy one, bring it in, draft the provisions of the will, and have somebody sign it. So that's a very common ground that a will can be challenged on. So is the ground that the elderly person who passed away was vulnerable in some way and taken advantage of by a younger person who made them sign something that they wouldn't have normally done in their right mind? Absolutely, and it's just as simple as that person did not know or was aware of what they were signing. They lacked the knowledge of the actual document that they were signing. So that brings me to the point then, I guess it's, it's part of the law that your will is not valid unless you are mentally competent to sign one. Good, good, very good point there. Because you have to have what we call testamentary capacity in order to execute a will. And so what you is have testament? to be of right mind? Absolutely, and I think the threshold test in the classic case said for somebody to have testamentary capacity, they have to understand the bounty they're giving away. So is that the most common reason why uh, the children of a deceased person or maybe the ex-husband or wife would challenge a will saying this person did not have, well, they were not of right mind when they signed it? It's, it's, it's very common. I think it's probably one of the most used grounds. Another ground that I'm starting to see a lot of is undue influence. Let's just say we have a family setting where there's two or three children and one of the children are now estranged. That person can come back after mom or dad has passed away and said, well, I believe that the first two children who were closer to mom unduly influenced her made me the bad guy, which is why I'm now disinherited so under the will. So is that like poisoning the person against you, turning them against, bad-mouthing you? Absolutely. So when this happens, let's say that the person is of right mind and they write a will and they don't want to include a particular child or relative that they have reasons, they have their own reasons, how can you protect yourself from later when you're dead having them come after the estate? Very, very good question. And, and I like to uh, group this in two different strategies you can use. You can use pre-death strategies, what I like to label, or post-death strategies. Let's talk about the pre-death strategies. In a pre-death strategy, somebody, let's just call them the testator, the person who's drafting the will, 
could gift their gifts away. So even if a will challenge was successful, well, guess what? All the, all the assets are gifted away. Or the, oh, you've given it away while you're alive. Absolutely. Well, but you may not know how long you're going to live. Absolutely. So well, there's a bit of a risk to that. And this is the biggest risk. By utilizing this tool, it's the biggest risk. You want to make sure that you have enough assets for your support. Because they might not give it back. And that's number two. I'm just saying. What happens if it doesn't come back? Another strategy you can util utilize is the videotape. Now, so how does that work? Can you make a video explaining why you cut this person out? Under most jurisdictions, you cannot uh, videotape a will. But you could have a videotape in place, which explains to someone why they're being disinherited. And it'll be very hard, I believe, to look at a will, if it was my mom, and she said, Rick, well, guess what? I'm not going to give you a part of my estate because I have not had a relationship with you in the past 15 years. Does the, do people do this? Absolutely. They make a video, and, and then when does it get watched? Right at the funeral? <laughs> <laughs> that I hope would not. be some funeral. <laughs> Absolutely. But there's cons with the videotape as well, right? If I'm reviewing the videotape, my hostile eyes are going to be looking for any little thing I can use to support my claim that mom did not have the mental health. For instance, she could have missed spoken a name. Instead of saying Rich, she could have said Richard. But you could use that to say, hey, mom wasn't in the right frame of mind. She's calling me by a completely different name. She could be nervous. Her eyes could be all over the camera. She could be jittery, nail biting. Well, what about having the lawyer there? Have you ever been asked to be there when the video is being uh, filmed and maybe even be on the screen so that the person watching it can say, well, she had her lawyer there? Well, very good point. I have not been asked as yet. I think would you do it? I would. If they said, look, I want you to speak first and say, I've interviewed this person. I believe this person is of sound mind and, and body. I, I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they are fit to say what they're about to say. I, I believe if, if, they, if that person had a medical letter from their doctor or some sort of assessment completed that they were in the right mind, I would, I would go on videotape and vouch for it. Absolutely. Well, that's some very good advice. I, uh, I may be availing myself of that in the future. One never knows. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Your Honor. Hello, I'm Lauren McLean. Today in Q&A, our question is, I'm separating. Should I put our family deal in writing? Family agreements are viable and binding options for preventing or resolving family law disputes. Homemade agreements made without the benefit of legal advice won't carry much weight with a judge. So using lawyers helps protect both of you. Fair agreements will be upheld, but outrageous bargains may be ignored or varied by the courts. Child custody agreements may be set aside by the court if the agreement is not in the best interest of the child. Similarly, as child support is the right of the child, agreements to waive or reduce child support below required amounts are unenforceable. Property or spousal support agreements may be set aside where, one, there was a lack of financial disclosure, two, one party took unfair advantage of the other. Three, one party didn't understand the nature of the agreement. Or four, if the events in a marriage did not unfold roughly as predicted by the parties. Too often separating spouses try to be a hero or a martyr. Talk to a lawyer before signing any agreement to avoid disaster. Thanks for watching. For extended interviews and exclusive content, please visit our website at familymatterstv.com. If you'd like to submit your legal question to our Q&A, go to advicescene.com. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone. See you next time.